Good morning. We're going to get started with our 10 o'clock press conference, New Science from NASA's Parker Solar Probe Mission. First speaker will be Nicolene Vile from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. We'll have Dim Warbury from Imperial College London, Kelly Corrick from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, Nathan Sweden from Princeton University and the University of New Hampshire, and Carl Betams from the United States Naval Research Academy. I'm going to turn it over to Nicolene. All right, well, hi, everybody. I'm Nicolene Vile from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And we're all here to talk to you today about Parker Solar Probe and some of the new, exciting uh, results that we've gotten. Uh, Parker Solar Probe has, is the closest human-made object to the sun. It's gotten closer than any human-made object has ever gotten before. It's already flown inside the orbit of Mercury and is sampling material closer than any spacecraft ever has before. So here, what we're looking at is an artist's rendition of the sun and the material that flows off of the solar atmosphere out into the solar system. We call this material the solar wind, and it fills the entire solar system. It bombards all of the planets, including Earth, and it interacts with Earth's magnetic field. Here we're looking at Parker Solar Probe data, WHISPER data. Let me see. There we go. All right, we're looking at WHISPER data. We're looking at the density of this solar wind, of this material that's filling the solar system, but we're looking at it up close. Solar, Parker Solar Probe also has in situ instruments that measures directly this material as it's flying through it. And we can see some structure in the density in the solar wind that we're seeing now at a level of complexity and detail that we've never seen before. And those details give us information about how the solar wind was formed, the processes that happened back at the sun that create it. Uh, details that we've had hints of before, but we've never seen so close. We're also using information from all of our other telescopes and spacecraft to really piece together the full story of what it is that Parker Solar Probe is flying through. So here I'm showing an orbit of Parker Solar Probe in orange around the sun in the center. Earth is here in green, and one of our spacecraft stereo is over here in red. And so you can see by looking at what's coming off of the sun from Earth, and also looking at what's coming off of the sun from stereo, we can really see what it is that Parker Solar Probe is flying through. So here's a movie of, again, the density, this uh, solar wind density, this material coming off the sun from stereo, and we see Parker Solar Probe flying through it. So by looking at the up-close details with Parker Solar Probe and comparing them to this global picture of what stereo is seeing, we can really paint a full picture and understanding. Here's that same set of images of density from the stereo spacecraft, but now there's been a lot of processing done to the images to really pull out some of these little tiny details, some of these small features in the solar wind that give us hints about how the solar wind is formed. Again, because we've flown through it with those in situ measurements, we can really understand some of the details that we've only had hints at before. So this matters because it's telling us about fundamental physical processes as this material is created and sent out into the solar system. It also matters because of the connection between the sun and the earth. Even though these structures are small in this movie right here, they're actually large compared to earth and earth's magnetic field. This is another visual, um, another artist's rendition of earth and earth's magnetic field and these structures as they pass by. And because they're density structures, they actually squeeze earth's magnetic field and release it. They drive dynamics in Earth's magnetic field and Earth's radiation belt on a regular day. They're not the big dynamics that we're going to hear later on, but they're the ones that are there every single day. So it's really important to understand how these things are made back at the sun and what they look like when they get to the Earth. Next, we're going to hear from Tim Horbury, who's going to talk about other kinds of structures that we see in the solar wind. Thanks a lot, Nikki. Hello, everybody. My name is Tim Holby from Imperial College, London. 
So Nikki's told you about how Parker Solar Probe growing close to the sun is revealing a lot of fine scale structure that we haven't seen before. And I'm going to talk about things on even smaller scales. So the measurements that Parker is making with, of the magnetic field and the plasma environment around the spacecraft have revealed an enormous array of phenomena on very small scales. I can't talk about all of those today. I'm going to talk about one in particular. So on the left-hand side, uh, you can see a picture of the sun in ultraviolet light. And this is showing us a, a, a picture of the atmosphere of the sun. And the glow there is because of the very hot plasma environment. And you can also see dark patches here. These are called coronal holes. And the, there was open magnetic field coming from those coronal holes, and the plasma flows off into interplanetary space at very high speeds, hundreds of kilometers a second, in a very smooth, constant flow. Now, we've known about these coronal hole flows for a long time. We can measure them uh, in interplanetary space near the Earth, for example. But the models that we have of those don't explain the speeds that we see. So we understand the basic physics behind the generation of the solar wind, that that hot plasma has a pressure and it makes the solar wind accelerate into interplanetary space. But the models that we have cannot explain the high speeds that we see. So we've known for a long time that there has to be an additional energy source to try and accelerate the wind. And indeed, that's one of the key science objectives of Parker Solar Probe, is to explain the flow of energy from the sun that heats the solar corona and accelerates the solar wind. So those theories that we've had so far have essentially uh, fallen into two classes. One is that uh, it's a process of intermittent release of magnetic energy on the sun. So the sun's magnetic field is very tangled, and the uh, energy can be released in an explosive way, for example, in a solar flare. And so the theory is that there may be many more very small events on the sun, so-called nanoflares, which may be providing this energy source. The other class of theories is based on waves, that there may be a population of waves in the solar corona, and the momentum of those waves as they travel up away from the sun can actually accelerate the wind. And in fact, when we measure the solar wind near the Earth in these high-speed streams, we see an enormous population of waves filling into planetary space in those streams. And so for a long time, people have, have, uh, there's been a general view that probably waves is the answer to this acceleration problem, although we don't know the details. But now with Parker Solar Probe, we've gone closer than ever before, as Nikki has said, and that's revealed a radically different picture. So Parker Solar Probe, at its first encounter, and this actually shows a picture of the sun during the first encounter, Parker was not connected to the large dark coronal hole on the left-hand side. Rather, it was connected to a small one on the right-hand side. And these white lines are model magnetic field lines emanating from that coronal hole um, towards the spacecraft, which was on the right-hand side. So as Parker flew through this coronal hole flow, it saw something really different to what we've seen before. And that wave field resolves into a, an enormous array, thousands and thousands of very fine-scale structures. These things are very short on the spacecraft time scale, from seconds to just a few minutes. And using Parker's unique orbit, we can use the information and the measurements that we make to actually understand the structure of these objects. And they turn out to be very long, thin tubes along the plasma flow. So they are hundreds of thousands of kilometers long, but their cross-section is incredibly small. So on average, these things are just a few thousand kilometers across, so about the scale size of the Earth. So for the solar wind, that's really small. So what are these stru uh, structures that we see? Well, they have uh, kinks in the magnetic field inside, which we've shown schematically here. So let me show you a movie which sort of shows that in a bit more detail. So these are kinks in the magnetic field. And in fact, the magnetic field can be twisted all the way back as we go through these structures. And the magnetic field uh, has a tension. And if you twist the magnetic field like this, it carries a lot of energy. So these things are carrying a lot of energy out into the solar wind. And actually, as a result, they accelerate the plasma that's within it to a higher speed than the background solar wind. So the plasma inside these structures can actually have roughly twice the kinetic energy of the background solar wind. So that's an enormous uh, amount of energy to uh, feed into the solar wind. And clearly, this is a key part of the puzzle as to how the sun accelerates the solar wind to such high energies. So we're seeing enormous numbers of these structures. So the wave field, therefore, that we see further out, as we go closer in, it turns out that wave field originally, when it's born, is actually a lot of fine scale structure which evolves into those waves. So that means, therefore, the idea that maybe all of these, uh, this energy is provided by waves is probably not the case. And rather, there must be some impulsive process happening on the sun generating all of these fine-scale jet-like structures. So this is a movie of the sun taken roughly when Parker went through that uh, first encounter. And what I hope you can see here, as well as the large-scale structure, is a lot of little dots and flashes going off all the time. This is plasma being heated by the release of magnetic energy. There aren't enough of these flashes, and actually they're too large, to explain what we see. But we think, therefore, there's probably a population of very small uh, 
magnetic uh, events happening across the sun all the time, and these are providing the additional energy source to power the solar wind. So this is early days. We don't understand the details of this yet. For example, we don't have an idea about the full magnetic field in struct uh, structure inside these objects. Uh, and, and clearly, we are not yet observing those events on the sun, which explain uh, what we see. So Parker, uh, so far, has only gone to 35 solar radii. But over the next few years, as the perihelion drops down finally to under 10 solar radii, we're going to see these structures even closer to the sun than ever before. And I think rather than having sketches like this, in a few years' time, we're finally going to have the answer to one of the key questions from Parker Solar Probe, which is how the sun generates the solar wind and heats the solar corona. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'll hand you over now to Kelly, who's going to talk to you about something really different, some really large-scale structures in the solar wind. Thank you, Tim. Hi, my name is Kelly Cork. I'm an astrophysicist at the Smithsonian, and I'm head of the science operations for the Sweep Instrument Suite aboard Parker Solar Probe. So shown here, we see this coronal mass ejection, this very large scale. We have that similar EUV image of the sun on the bottom, and you see a flare happen, and this uh, ejects tons and tons of mass out into the heliosphere, equivalent to 80 million school buses being thrown at millions of miles an hour um, out towards the Earth and towards uh, the moon or any other place uh, in the solar system. And so this is what, what view that we've had so far. We've done a lot of remote sensing. We do sense them in situ um, at L one, um, but we also at the uh, near the Earth, but we also uh, mainly view them in remote sensing. Now, Parker Solar Probe, we predicted that we would um, we would go in situ, probably fly through only one of them, and uh, so we were looking at the sun during the first encounter. This is an EUV image of the sun from the Stereo spacecraft during the first encounter, and you don't really see anything, right? You don't see those huge explosions that you did at the, at first. Even if I kind of show you that, oh, you should possibly look here. There's no hints of anything actually going on in the extreme ultraviolet on the sun at that point in time, um, and this speaks to the fact that there's a class of CMEs called stealth CMEs, CMEs that we don't quite know about um, and can't, uh, can't see in the traditional EUV. But if you do uh, processing of these images from the stereo spacecraft, you begin to start to see that there are things flowing out of the sun and a coronal mass ejection coming out there to actually uh, fly what Parker actually flies through. So we couldn't have seen this from the Earth because the Earth, uh, the sun was in between the Earth and Parker. Um, and so we needed the stereo spacecraft in order to observe this. And why this is important, this is this here is showing a uh, animation of a coronal mass ejection, those 80 million uh, school buses coming at us at, a, at millions of miles an hour, coming towards the Earth and actually interacting with, a, with our magnetic field, like Nikki uh, said earlier. And what it causes is it can cause beautiful aurora. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the best effects of this. However, in our technologically driven society, it can also do things like wipe out power grids, um, interfere with satellites, um, and, other, um, and other things like as such. So we really need to understand how to predict these. And if there are things like a stealth CME, we're going to need to understand what those are, what that class of CME is. And Parker helps us by actually going there and actually measuring and seeing what the environment is and seeing how we can better detect those, those um, CMEs. So this is a plot I understand that most only the scientists can love. It's not the pretty pictures, but this is the data that is so important to understanding those structures and where, uh, what they're doing. The uh, CME that, we, that you saw in the stereo images, in the black and white images, um, are here. This is the coronal mass ejection area that we're talking about. On the top, you have a magnetic field measurements made by the field's uh, instrument suite on Parker. Um, the total magnetic field is on top. The blue are different components or different directionalities of the, magne of the magnetic field. And that twi characteristic twist is something we look for when we're, when we're looking for coronal mass ejections. Um, in, we also have then the radial velocity um, here. We have a density, a drop in density um, in this area, as well as a drop in temperature um, during that coronal mass ejection. So these types of, th of studies are really going to help us understand what are the characteristics of these stealth CMEs so we can predict them in the future, especially to protect ourselves for things such as the energetic particles also associated with, with these things that can cause hazards to, um, hazards to astronauts as well as to our, our uh, power grids. So next up, I'm going to hand over to Nathan Schwagen to talk more about those energetic particles. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I'm Nathan Schwaderin. I'm the uh, head of the ESIS instrument suite, the Energetic Particle Instrument Suite on, um, on, on Parker Solar Probe. I'm head of the Science Operations Center um, and a professor at the University of New Hampshire. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about energetic particles. Um, energetic particles uh, move at the speed of light, um, and they're extremely hazardous, uh, both to humans in space and to electronic equipment in space. So we really need to understand the physics um, and use that physics to be able to predict and therefore mitigate the hazards associated with these energetic particles. I'm going to be telling to you today about um, our study with Parker Solar Probe by actually going there to the sun. We managed to discover one of the key missing links between how the sun produces flares and energetic particles from solar flares, and then how those, those particles end up at very, very high energies, um, uh, ultimately to, to cause the hazards that they cause. Um, and I'll be describing results from one of the largest solar energetic particle events that we've observed so far in the Parker mission. So to begin with, I just wanted to show a movie. Um, this is a historic event, one of the large, larger events that we observed in 2002. And as this movie goes in, we're focusing close into a region, a very strong magnetic field near an active region, and you're starting to see reconnection and the flaring processes associated with that. Those release energetic particles. Um, and in just a second, we're going to blow out, and you'll see the release of a coronal mass ejection that comes out through interplanetary space. And last, you see what looks like snow in the detector. Those are these, these uh, energetic particles moving close to the speed of light that are actually penetrating the de detector, and you're seeing literally the damage that's caused uh, by these, these energetic particles. Okay, in terms of the hazards, um, there's an array of hazards associated with energetic particles. Um, for astronauts in space, um, you have long-term problems such as cancer. There's also shorter-term problems in terms of um, uh, skin issues, so like serious burns, uh, uh, issues with the central nervous system and the eyes. Um, issues associated with blood forming organs, and at very high fluxes, th these, these events can cause uh, lethality. Um, relatedly, these energetic particles can also damage electronic equipment and lead to satellite loss. You're okay here, you guys don't need to run for cover, we're protected on Earth uh, by Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so in this study, um, we are going to be studying the uh, as I said, this, the source of these events by actually going there close to the sun. Um, and though the event that we observed was small compared to historically large events, we still are getting insight into the fundamental processes that are happening very close to the sun. Um, this is a simulation uh, of, a, of a larger historical event that was done by those guys right down there at the University of New Hampshire in predictive science. And it shows uh, the uh, magnetic reconnection, the changing the magnetic fields in the inner heliosphere, and on the far right, the release of energetic particles that are accelerated by the coronal mass ejection. So these processes are all fundamentally related. Okay, so now what we've seen on Parker Solar Probe, if you watch this movie, Parker Solar Probe is coming out of its second orbit. It's moving out to roughly uh, half an AU. And at this point in the movie, you're gonna start to see the release of a number of coronal mass ejections that actually pass over the Parker Solar Probe spacecraft. Um, so here's one of those, and you can see that that sweeps over the spacecraft, um, you know, sort of on the flank of, of, of the coronal mass ejection. You can also see, um, in particular over here, if you watch this movie closely, what looks like material that's building up near the front of that coronal mass ejection. These coronal mass ejections are like snow plows, and they sweep up the material in front of them. And it turns out for the first time we've seen that sweeping process, how those coronal mass ejections also sweep up energetic particles from flares. And so it is those flares that end up at very high energies. And it's that process, it's observing that directly, that gives us key insight into how coronal mass ejections build up the, the dangerous fluxes of energetic particles we see. That is the missing link uh, that we've discovered uh, in this process. Okay, um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, to Carl, who's going to tell you uh, about uh, dust in the inner heliosphere. Thanks, Nathan. Good morning, everybody. I'm Carl Battens from the Naval Research Lab. I'm part of the WISPER science team. And I'm going to switch things up a little bit for this final talk. You've been hearing pretty much all week, really, that Parker has returned some fantastic science results 
and it's already just with a, a limited data return is answering so many questions that we had going into the mission and that's a sign of a great mission when right off the bat you're getting answers to all of these questions that you had but one of the the truly remarkable things about uh, the Parker mission is that it's also giving us answers to questions that we weren't even asking and in fact what I'm going to talk about is a question that isn't even related to heliophysics so the movie that I'm showing right here is uh, data from our Whisper camera during the first Parker Solar Probe encounter. So with Whisper, we have the sun is just outside of our field of view. We're looking at the uh, basically looking at space in invisible light. We keep the sun outside of the field of view so it doesn't blind our cameras. So we kind of block out the bright light that allows us to see all the faint structures, some of the stuff you've been hearing about this morning. So you've got coronal mass ejections, solar outflow. That's all the stuff that the mission was designed to see, and it's, we're seeing it fantastically well in this data. But what we're also seeing is stuff that's kind of familiar to us um, from our previous missions, like SOHO and STEREO. We get these beautiful views of the solar system. So we get in the Milky Way going across the, the frame there. The, there's a beautiful star field in the background. There's planets in there, we see asteroids, so all of this stuff is, again, it's familiar to us, it's, it's wonderful to see, but what's truly remarkable about Parker is it's showing us something, we've seen something in the data that we have never seen before on any of our instruments, and in fact, no one has ever seen before. So right here, this is very faint, but between these red arrows, there is like a very faint, dusty line. And in a moment, I'll play a movie, and maybe you'll see it a little bit better. But that line is actually a dust trail, or maybe I should even call it a rubble trail. Uh, it lo doesn't look very big in this image. Uh, it's actually about 100,000 kilometers wide. It's uh, the part of it that you see there is about 20-some million kilometers long. It's a huge trail. And it's a trail that's following the orbit of an asteroid called Phaethon. Now, Phaethon's kind of an interesting asteroid. It's, it's a fairly big guy. It's pushing six kilometers in size. Um, it gets very close to the sun, actually as close to the sun as Parker Solar Probe does. It also gets very close to Earth and is actually listed as a uh, potentially hazardous asteroid, although there's no immediate threat to Earth. But what's kind of cool about Phaethon is that a couple of thousand years ago, it went by the sun, and something happened to it. We don't know what, but something happened to it. And it released a huge, huge debris trail that we, call, that we now call the Geminid meteor shower at Earth. So every year, our planet goes plunging through the giant meteor trail in space, and our sky gets lit up by all these shooting stars. And by coincidence, actually, the peak of the Geminid meteor shower is just this weekend. And what we're seeing in the whisper images is actually that meteor shower. Or it's part, I should say, it is part of that meteor shower. So I'm gonna play this movie now. It's the same movie you saw before, but we've processed it slightly differently. And so you have gotta use a little bit of imagination to see the trail, because it does kind of move through our field of view as, as we move around the sun. But um, trust me, it's there. <laughs> um, but we, so my colleagues at uh, Naval Research Lab and University of Maryland, we've been studying this dust trail for a while, and we had several questions about it that we wanted to answer. The first thing we wanted to know was, like, what is the nature of this trail? Where did it come from? So I mentioned that Phaethon gets very close to the sun. It gets as close to the sun as Parker does. When it gets close to the sun, that, that solar radiation uh, heats up the surface and actually causes the surface to, to fracture, and it releases dust, so we know when Phaethon goes close to the sun, it's releasing dust all of the time. And so our first question was, well, is this dust something that is being released by Phaethon now every time it goes by the sun, or is it something related to these geminids that happened a couple of thousand years ago? And so we have calculated the mass, so how much stuff basically is in this whole trail, and it's something on the order of like a, a billion kilograms. It's a, sorry, a, yeah, a billion kilograms or a million tons of material. And we know that the rate at which Phaethon produces dust near the sun is nowhere near sufficient to create the mass of dust that we're seeing in this trail. However, we also know that based on the, the rate at which meteors come into our atmosphere every December, 
we know that the amount of dust we're seeing here is more comparable to the amount of dust that's contained in the Geminid meteor shower. So we're very confident that we are indeed seeing the, the Geminid meteor shower. So that's really one of our sort of main um, conclusions from this. The, other, the, the importance of this is that people have been looking for this trail for a long time. We know it exists because our planet goes plunging through it every year, but we don't really know the structure of the trail. Like, uh, is Earth flying through the most dense part? Are there other parts of the, the, the shower that are more dense than others? And so just even a couple of years ago, there was a Hubble telescope search for the trail, and they were unable to detect the trail. Um, with, in our study that we've done here, we have actually figured out why Hubble was unable to detect it. I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm happy to answer that question. But we are with this data and in successive passages by the sun, because Parker's going to go by the sun a whole bunch of times, Every time we go by, we're going to see the same trail, we're going to get these same observations, and every time we're going to learn a little bit more about this trail and really start to address uh, some of the questions that we have about the, this meteor shower that we pass through every year. So um, with that, I know all of us are really eager to talk about our science and answer your questions, so I will uh, open the floor to questions, and uh, thank you all for your attention. Yes. <laughs> so, as your, as the, as the, as the, the thing that you're talking about, the thing, the thing you're talking about. Yeah, Phaethon, yeah. Phaethon, it goes by. Does it go in the same path every year? Or does it change? Yes, Phaethon is on, Phaethon is on its own. It's on a fairly stable orbit on short, on reasonable time scales. It's on a pretty stable orbit. So it's, and Phaethon is on a very slightly different orbit to the Geminid meteor shower. So although Earth passes through the, the Geminid meteor shower every year. Thankfully, we don't cross paths with Faith on every year because that would be quite scary. <laughs> yes, 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 dinosaur scary, yes. Sorry, do we have more questions from reporters? <laughs> Hi, I have a question about the stealth CMEs. Um, what is the significance of them? Are they different from any other CME in any other way besides how we can see them? In general, they tend to be smaller, uh, but in ge uh, but it really is the, that lack of detection. And so detection is what we really need to do in order to save ourselves from space weather. Um, so that's the major difference, is just not being able to see them in the extreme ultraviolet. I also have a question about the South CME. So it, the the reason that we're not seeing them in ultraviolet is that does that have something to do with like are, I guess what do we think is making them so stealthy? Um, and then how are we going to get around the fact that we can't see them through traditional methods? And then I also have a clarification for Nathan after sure. that okay. question. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so how we're going to get around it is measure it in C2 and measure these as they're coming off. And as you saw in the processing, we were able to process the data in different ways uh, to try to bring it out in the visual. Um, and then in the C2, it's, it's easier to actually measure the changes in, in magnetic field and, and tell that those uh, that's it. But that's also part of Parker's um, mission and and the and what the data is starting to reveal is that the magnetic just topology in general that happens near the sun is different and so we're going to need to do a lot of detective work and have a lot more data from Parker uh, to see the switchbacks and the south CMEs and how they all kind of relate to each other in that magnetic family of structures um, around the sun. And does the sort of stealthy quality does that indicate to you that maybe they're produced from be a different mechanism than the sort of regular CME or? Exactly, it, it hints at where their source is and where that material is actually coming from in the in the corona, how, how high up, how low down type of thing, because uh, we don't see them brightly in the extreme ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. So wh how so what is like what is the hint what are we what, um, what so do we think is so the hints then are ones? the fact that you do see them in the um, you can see them when they're process when the when the things are processed so you're actually seeing the material come off 
Um, and then uh, there's been a lot of modeling. So some of the modeling, to, do, to go back to the source of where these CMEs come from, um, it was a, fr a connection between the uh, polar coronal hole and, um, and something at the, basically, the equator of the sun reconnecting and then shooting out that. So it, it's not as localized, in some ways it's not as localized um, as, as it was previously, as you see when you, when you have a bright uh, ejecta coming off. Right. And then, is it okay if I ask? Okay, so Nathan, um, I just wanted to clarify. So what the your results indicate is that the the thing that is causing these energetic par particles to become so energetic is them getting pushed out by by the snowplow of the coronal mass ejection, or um, so uh, it's it's actually the um, we're observing a process that happens before the large. Um, amounts of energization that happens further on. So we've never been able to observe uh, these processes happening so close to the sun. And as a result of that, um, we're able to address a question that we've had for years, and that is to how populations of particles build up prior to being accelerated. And so the direct, we were able to make the direct observation for the first time of, of the populations that are produced by solar flares building up in this snowplow region in front of, in front of CMEs. Um, so that, that buildup of fluxes right now, we're see, we see it in very early stages before a lot of subsequent acceleration has happened. Um, but we still now understand that buildup, we can start to understand the buildup process, which then preconditions the acceleration to much higher energies. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we just, we, we've never seen this material in the process of building up in those, re in those regions. And so it's always been a question as to where, where that came from. How, how did that process, how did that build up occur? Hi, I'm Catherine Cornai, freelance writer. Uh, question for Carl. Mm -hmm. In the images you showed, there were other trails. Are those other asteroids? What are those? No, a lot of the trails you'll see in those images are dust streaks just from sporadic pieces of dust in space, not related to the trail we're seeing. It's just that the region of space we're flying through is relatively dusty, and we're kind of bombing through at 80 kilometers per second. So we're, um, we're seeing quite a bit of dust in the images. So how did you pinpoint it to this asteroid? Do you know the tracks of all of them and you just correlated we, or? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a case of, okay, we see a big trail, it looks like a dust trail following something. What do we know that goes in that region of space? And so we start kind of testing a few things and then you plug in the numbers for the orbit of the asteroid Phaethon. And it's like, oh, hey, look at that, it, it, it's a perfect match. So that's, um, that's how we figured that one out. Uh, Daniel Stolte, University of Arizona. I'm also curious about Phaethon. So that trail that you saw, um, am I assuming correctly, it's, uh, you said it's about 200 million kilometers long, something like that. So it's not circular, right? It's, is it just it's where a, it gets no, closest? I, so I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, actually, because I wanted to clarify that point. We see a portion. Ah. In the images, we are seeing a segment, roughly like a, a 20 million kilometer long segment of something that is a complete orbit in space. Ah. So the whole thing, I think, is like six astronomical units long or something like that. So but I was just pointing out that we, we're seeing some portion of that passing through our images. Do we have further questions from reporters in the audience? Chat, Sarah? No questions on chat? Going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to close this then. Thank you to our panelists. I'm sure they'll be here for a few minutes if you come up with some more questions. We're going to resume at 11 with an update from ESA's solar mission. You want a double header?